Let's just let the things of man on. What the temp of earth? You want that the breath? What if I told you there's a real-life prototype lurking behind The Sopranos? Despite David Chase disavowing any connection, the uncanny resemblance is observed by members of this real-life mafia family. As in The Sopranos, the real-life Sopranos eliminated their boss with unconventional tendencies, and their acting boss died of cancer, just like Jackie April on the show. And a real-life Salvatore Bonpensiero, with a fate diverging from his on-screen counterpart. Brace yourself for an encounter with the real Sopranos. The soldiers, you know, soldiers don't go to hell. Picture this, Prohibition era North Jersey, where booze flowed, mob bosses reigned, and power struggles were as common as a Sunday dinner. Now imagine two formidable mafia families, the Newark family led by Gaspar D'Amico and the Elizabeth family led by Stefano Badami. Fast forward to 1935 and enter Vincenzo Troia, a man with grand plans to seize control. Sort of the Richie April of the time. Plot twist. He gets whacked. D'Amico flees after a not-so-friendly assassination attempt, leaving the commission to divvy up his turf among the five families and Badami's Elizabeth family. Stefano Badami steps into the chaos, but his reign! Let's just say it set the stage for an epic power struggle. As the Newark and Elizabeth factions duked it out for supremacy, Badami held the reins until 1955 when, you guessed it, he met a bloody end. The shooting. Whatever happened there, God rest his soul. Enter Filippo Amari, Badami's underboss, stepping up to the plate. He ruled with an iron fist, but his tenure was cut short by internal strife. Amari hightails it to Sicily, and in comes Nicholas Nick Delmore. Delmore, a man with a knack for navigating the underworld, took the helm until illness struck in the early 60s. He passed away in 1964, paving the way for a new era. No bitch to me. Enter Simone de Cavalcante, nephew to Delmore, stepping into the spotlight as the new boss of the officially recognized de Cavalcante crime family of North Jersey. The golden age dawned under Sam de Cavalcante's rule, reaching power and wealth peaks that had even New York Mafia members contemplating a family upgrade. Oh! These real Sopranos ran the show in New Jersey's construction scene, dabbling in gambling, protection rackets, and heists. During the swinging 60s, they even dipped into the world of adult entertainment, making the 80s their playground for scams, from insurance schemes to stock market manipulations. You're supposed to push for best I, I was just... Under Sam's reign, the De Cavalcantes expanded their influence, playing puppet master with the governor and mayor. But drama found them too. Sam's office had a little bug from 1961 to 1965, capturing all the juicy family secrets. Although sneaky recordings couldn't nail him directly, prison had a spot for Sammy. In 1971, they charged Sam with running a gambling empire, but his heart issues granted him a sweet deal, two years instead of five. Heading down to Florida, he left Giovanni John the Eagle Riggy to run the show. Rumor has it, Sammy was still the family's secret advisor into the 90s, leaving the FBI scratching their heads. <laughs> John the Eagle rose in the late 50s, catching the DeCavalcante's attention. By the 60s, Sam promoted Riggy to Capo, and by 1973, he handed him the boss's seat. Riggy's reign continued the family's legacy, inspiring the generation that would later become the Sopranos characters. But hold on tight, the juicy stuff from the end of the 20th century is coming your way. Oh. In the early 90s, the feds locked up Eagle for what they called labor racketeering. <laughs> but you know, giving up power was never his style. Instead, he passed the torch to Vincent, Vinny Ocean Palermo, the Tony Soprano prototype in our real-life mob drama. Born in 1944, Vinny faced the mean streets of Brooklyn early on. Losing his pops, he dove into work, landing at the Fulton Fish Market. That's where he got the nickname Ocean, a nod to his fishmonger days that somehow stuck as he graduated to owning a seafood shop. What's that smell? Did you guys go to a sushi bar? And as we remember, Uncle Junior and Livia reveal savory details about the shady exploits of Tony and his gang. Tony, the ringleader himself, was once a legend in lobster stealing. Fast forward to the 60s, Vinny ties the knot with Sam de Cavalcante's niece, setting off a chain of events that would write his fate in the Jersey family. If destiny hadn't intervened, Vinny might have been in the Big Apple mob scene. But fate had other plans, and by the late 70s, 
Ocean officially joined the Decavalcantes. Now, what Vinny was up to from wedding bells to mob initiation is shrouded in mystery. This guy was practically a ghost to the authorities until the 90s, and evidence of his early crimes only hit the FBI a decade later. We're talking murders on orders from family boss John Riggi. First on the hit list, Fred Weiss, mixed up in construction scams with the Gambino family. The FBI got wind of the whole thing, and he was facing serious time in jail. Gotti thought Weiss was a liability, so the Gambinos teamed up with the De Cavalcantes, led by Vinny Ocean himself. Two houses, two mob factions, Weiss didn't stand a chance. Bang, bang, and he was out. It's worth noting that the De Cavalcante family had a great devotion to Gotti and carried out all of his commands unquestioningly. In exchange, Gotti would provide them with backup and advocacy whenever a conflict or a dispute occurred. Does that ring any bells? Oh. Well, Johnny Sack also frequently assisted Tony and his crew in settling disputes on The Sopranos. But hold up, trouble was brewing within the family. Louis Fat Lou LaRosso, a former conciliaire, wanted his underboss thrown back, causing a rift. In 1991, Vinny led the hit squad again, taking out Fat Lou. But the twist? The main advocate for the hit, John D'Amato, got dealt with too. Why? Suspicions about his unconventional interests. In 1991, John D'Amato got himself a new girlfriend and revealed his bisexuality. She spilled the beans to her gangster friend, and the rumor eventually reached the Deca Volcantes. In a shocking turn of events, underboss Giacomo Amari and consigliere Stefano Vitabile orchestrated the execution of their own boss, D'Amato, deploying a hit squad comprised of Anthony Capo, Vincent Palermo, and James Gallo. What makes this hit even more jaw-dropping? The plotters blatantly defied Cosa Nostra rules by not seeking approval from the powerful Mafia Commission in New York before carrying out the hit on D'Amato. You're a f disgrace. <laughs> now let's talk about a plot twist that's straight out of The Sopranos, the Asbestos Saga. Interestingly, back in the 80s, Anthony Capo decided to take on the glamorous world of certified asbestos abatement. But here's where it gets juicy. He confessed to snoozing through classes, and letting the school's operator ace the test for him. Fast forward to the courtroom drama, where a federal prosecutor throws a curveball, asking Capo about his knowledge of asbestos removal. His response? Hold on to your laughter. I wouldn't know asbestos if I was sitting on it. Oh! <laughs> Fast forward to the post-Amato era. Giacomo Jake Amari, the prototype of Jackie April Sr., took the reins, but stomach cancer said, not so fast. By 1997, he was out, and a ruling trio emerged, Vinnie Palermo, Jimmy Palermo, and Charles Majuri. However, Charles Majuri had other plans. He wanted Vinnie's spot and had no desire to compromise. You want compromise? How's this? However, he miscalculated with the hitman. Majuri assigned soldier James Gallo, who spilled the beans to Vinnie Ocean instead of carrying out the hit. But guess what? The hit never went down. Oh! And the feud somehow fizzled out. Interestingly, in season 5 of The Sopranos, when the power struggle takes place shortly after Carmine's passing, Tony Soprano suggests that Johnny Sack split the reins of power between Johnny, Dumas II, and Angelo Gareppi. What's this, the f***ing you in now? But let's get back to the real Sopranos. From then on, Vinny Ocean ruled the De Cavalcantes. His life mirrored Tony Soprano's family, wealth, and a stake in every shady business you could imagine. Gambling, loan sharking, labor racketeering, stock market schemes, you name it, Vinny had a finger in the pie. And let's not forget Wiggles, the notorious strip club, giving Bada Bing a run for its money. Like Tony, Palermo also had a private yacht on which he organized gambling in neutral waters. The De Cavalcantes also owned a pork store called Sacco's, which was the inspiration of the Satriales and the Sopranos. Joseph Uncle Joe Giacobbe, a longtime Decavalcante soldier who served as an acting capo following the promotion of Vinnie Ocean, operated out of the pork store, making Sacco's his headquarters. Essentially, the 90s were the golden era for Vinnie. Money was flowing, he held the reins in the family, and the FBI had no clue about his role in this thing of ours. But the 90s couldn't last forever. Vinnie's golden era came to an end when the Decavalcantes got their own Sal bon Pensiero someone ready to outdo his fictional counterpart. Oh, oh. Meet Ralph Guarino, the unsung hero in the crime documentary of the century. Sure, he may not have been born into the De Cavalcante's family, but destiny had other plans for him. 
plans involving a heist so wild it could only be compared to the chaotic brilliance of the Sopranos. Before Ralph became the government's undercover maestro, he pulled off a heist that left New York scratching its head. Not because of its cunning, but because of its sheer stupidity. Stupid the f***ing game. You gotta be on a U.S. Picture this. The infamous shopping center from the Sopranos opening credits, a friend with the inside scoop, and the Bank of America making a cash delivery to the 11th floor. What could possibly go wrong? Enter Ralph's genius plan. Recruit a bunch of small-time thugs, disarm guards, grab cash, and walk out like you're just picking up groceries. Simple, right? Well, not when your crew includes junky thugs like Richie Gillette, Melvin Folk, and Mike Reed, who bungled their way through the heist while exposing their faces to over 50 surveillance cameras. Naturally, they were almost immediately nabbed and pressured to spill the beans on the heist mastermind. But wait, there's more! Oh! Ralph, facing a hefty 20-year prison sentence... 20 f***ing years! Nah, what are you talking about? ...struck a deal with the FBI. Cue the wire, the wise guys, and a roller coaster ride of mobster drama. Ralph's first chat buddy? None other than Tommy DeTora, an associate from the Di Cavalcante family. The conversation was a wild ride, with Guarino pushing DeTora to talk to Vinny Ocean about unloading some foreign currency he'd recently swiped. Guarino's currency gig eventually hit a brick wall. They turned him down, citing Palermo's reluctance to dip his toes into a business that had become a hot topic on TV. Still, Ralph didn't escape notice. Hey! Little did the FBI know, they were about to dive into a world where Vincent Palermo, aka Vinny Ocean, called the shots. Thanks to Ralph, Vinny went from a shrimp heist relic to the FBI's prime target. As Ralph spun his web of deception, he found himself recording everything with Joseph Masella, Vinny's right-hand man. Gambling debts, thefts, and a doomed fate awaited Masella. He was lured to a remote parking lot and then shot. It won't be cinematic. Atic Masella's death led Ralph to cozy up to Joseph Sclafani, a longtime De Cavalcante soldier. Guarino's status had been rising in the family due to secret assistance from the FBI. And after Masella's murder, Palermo and the rest of the De Cavalcante leadership promoted Guarino to made man. By the way, if you remember that famous wiretap recording, those famous words belong to Sclafani. But like any good crime saga, paranoia set in. It's f Jimmy! What? The what? wire! It's f Jimmy! Around the summer of 99, almost a year after Ralph first hit the streets with a wire, the De Cavalcantes discovered they had a rat among them. Total paranoia set in, with everyone trying to sniff out the informant, leading to several murders. Ralph, the undercover virtuoso, was extracted by the FBI just in the nick of time. Any suspicion about being an informant went to the grave with Jimmy Altieri. Yeah, yeah. The De Cavalcantes faced a massive takedown in 1999. Oh my fucking Christ! With over 60 arrests and high-ranking members spilling the beans. Vinny Ocean, facing a potential death penalty, decides to start cooperating with the authorities and becomes a government witness. Are you fucking kidding me? You don't ever admit the existence of this thing. Vinny served two years, entered witness protection as James Cabela, and now owns strip clubs in Houston. Most interestingly, it appears that the De Cavalcantes have got their own lefty Ruggiero, Joseph Sclafani. Now, Joe found himself in the hot seat with extortion and gambling charges. His co-defendants, like flipping pancakes, turned state's witness in a flash. But not Sclafani. No plea bargains or backdoor deals for Sclafani. He looked the charges square in the eye, made his bed, and decided to lie in it. That's f***ing beautiful. <laughs> in a world of quick flips and double crosses, Sclafani pled guilty, taking an eight-year sentence. Get him, Bob. The De Cavalcantes took a major hit after these events. It's like they stumbled upon a script twist straight out of The Sopranos. Picture this. In 2010, the previous acting boss, Francesco Guaracci, personally got involved in shaking down a pizza joint for some dough. Fast forward to 2015, and it's safe to say it wasn't the family's best year. In August, their seasoned boss, John Riggi, who'd been holding down the fort in Elizabeth since the 40s, exits the stage at a ripe age of 90. And just a few months before that, Francesco Guaracci also punches his ticket to the mobster afterlife. 47. He was a f***ing kid. 
Then, the De Cavalcante family was hit with a blow that rocked them harder than a Soprano season finale cliffhanger. Meet Giovanni Rocco, the undercover maestro who waltzed into their ranks like a crime-fighting chameleon. Known on the mean streets of New Jersey as Giovanni Gatto, this cop had a resume longer than Tony Soprano's list of therapy sessions. Giovanni didn't just sneak into the mob, he practically became the conciliar of the De Cavalcante crew. Capo Charlie, the hat, Stango, treated him like family, and not just any family, the kind where you trust your right-hand man with your secrets. Giovanni was so deep undercover that he had capo-level privileges, attending high-stakes meetings and negotiating with the heavy hitters from New York's infamous mafia families. Between 2012 and 2015, he carved out a position as a capable and confident enforcer, even getting his own small crew to command. Then, the capo dropped a hit on Giovanni's lap, a little task called offing Luigi the dog Oliveri, a maid member causing headaches for the family. It was the climax of Giovanni's undercover symphony, and in March 2015, the final curtain fell. The arrests hit the De Cavalcantes. In the end, Charlie Stango, the capo with a rap sheet as colorful as a mafia rainbow, got slapped with a 10-year sentence for his murderous plot. 15 years. Meanwhile, Stango's son, Anthony Stango Jr., gets a six-year prison stretch. His crimes include orchestrating a prostitution ring, dealing hefty amounts of coke, and even having a shotgun in his collection as a bonus felony. Interestingly, in The Sopranos finale, Carlo Gervasi's son also gets nabbed by the FBI for drug dealing. Gervasi skips a meeting with Polly, sparking concerns of a betrayal. Soprano's attorney confirms a grand jury witness and impending indictments. So Carlo has flipped. We don't know. It's like David Chase saw it coming. As for the family's current status, it's a bit of a mystery. But word on the street is that Charles Big Ears Majuri might be holding the reins. Despite the setbacks, the real-life Sopranos, the De Cavalcantes, are still in the game, keeping things lively to this day. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more deep dives into the world of The Sopranos. And if you've ever wondered what shocking turns The Sopranos cast's lives have taken, don't miss out the video on The Sopranos, Where Are They Now?